get started? Yours. Okay. Well, everybody, welcome to Upstate South Carolina Linux Users Group. I was going to say Southeast Linux, but I do that every time. Um, let's see. So, uh, most of you in here know, but last month was Southeast Linux Fest. Uh, would someone from the board like to give a little brief? I nominate John Yeary. <laughs> How many people will you have attend at Southeast Linux Fest? Um, there were 742 people. 742? So it was a very successful event. Um, we basically doubled our size over the last year. And uh, I think uh, in terms of just the phenomenal growth, it actually turned out to be quite a, a good event. I, I think most people really had a good time at it. I know my son had a great time. I know a couple of the other board members' uh, kids had a great time. So uh, all the volunteers that put in the time that actually make it a success, uh, it was just amazing. The upload guys and, and the board members who participated uh, just made it a great time. And as a result of that event, we had to speak here tonight. So it was a pretty good deal. Um, any other announcements? Uh, regarding SELF 2011, we're looking at venues, bidding process, all that sort of thing. So uh, I know we have some non-locals here who happen to be in cities that are somewhat central to the southeast. And if we get bids from venues in that area, we might want to <coughs> call on your services to go out and take some pictures, that sort of thing. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, it's not optional. <laughs> Thank you for your participation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, so tonight we have C. Tyler Adams, is that right? Yeah. Adams, and he's going to present on um, Linux DNA, which is uh, compiling the kernel for using the Intel file, is that correct? <laughs> but he'll get into more detail than I possibly am. So, uh, um, you, did you get sick? Uh, during your, for your presentation at Southeast Linux Fest? I sure did. Oh, I'm sick. And so that's, okay. So he got sick, that's why he's given tonight. Um, we're lucky to have you. Thank you so much for coming up and, and doing the presentation. And, and without further ado, Tyler. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Tyler Adams. C stands for Claude. It's the only username here. Don't call me Claude. <laughs> This right here is the actual patch that we just released last night. It's uh, 26341, so we are pretty up to date with the latest uh, kernel out there. And let me get into the actual oops. This is why we have editing. <laughs> and when you get back going in, be nice and loud because my camera mic isn't exactly the best in the world. Don't okay. worry, I gave a talk the other day to the crowd uh, users group. And I practiced and all day. All day. Just to get this all these code examples. And uh, everything worked exactly the way it was supposed to because I rehearsed it all day. <laughs> and it ended up working eventually. I, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of goes to your credibility when you say it's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> what? Did you have it on dual display recently? No. No, this is actually really the first time this laptop has ever been hooked up to it. Maybe if I reboot real quick. No X. <laughs> Intel, thank you for the compiler. <laughs> Let's talk about your graphics cards now. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that is an Intel graphics card right there. Might be moving to the CPU soon. So. Okay, so 
good thing is this is a solid state drive, so it's Huh, I didn't think that sounded like a Linux error. He's fixing this guy's uh, virused up XP. Stuff. You're fixing his virused up XP with your XP that's complaining about security updates? <laughs> <laughs> you of all people, as the Joker, should know not to bring that here. Ooh, this is how I earn all my cash. <laughs> fixing the XP stuff. If it for XP, we wouldn't have jobs. That's pretty close. The Linux stuff just works. Max just works. Yeah, that, that comes in an exclusion. That, that's why they change the control panel every single time they do a new one because it confuses everybody. And then somebody gets to write a book about it. Yeah. This is the new control panel. Speaking of XP, did you see online this? Starting yesterday, I was already reading about uh, uh, Uncle Billy's going to. Uh, Support <laughs> XP until 20 to 20. Uncle Billy. 2020. 2020. Only for Service Pack 3. Yeah, Service Pack 3 until 2020. Man, that, that'd be a lot of people's careers just in XP. Yeah. It's already 10 years old. Can't give you too much grief because I spent half the work day dealing with somebody who upgraded to Windows 7. Yeah, that's good enough, I guess. Still got the uh, bars on it. But uh, I guess we'll start getting yeah, through. Yeah, Windows 7 is pretty much the So a lot of people have asked me, why did I start this project? What started this project? And I guess I did a trace route and it pretty much ends up at one of these screens right here. <laughs> That's it. These kernels that are built by Microsoft are going to be good. Actually, it might even start before that when I was on Mac Classic where you have the extensions. And you'd be doing something and, oh, this is great. Did you say you weren't? No. Frozen. Oh, what do you have to do? You have the hard reboot. So that's what eventually got me over to Linux uh, and tinkering. And it's worked ever since. So ICC is uh, Intel's compiler. Um, we use it to compile the kernel, and we also have uh, several side projects that we're working with Intel on, uh, including compiling with Firefox um, and, and different binaries. Uh, so the reason that we use ICC uh, is that, of course, uh, it's very fast. It's generally faster than GCC. Uh, in a lot of aspects, I have to be honest, GCC is a great compiler. It's fast. Um, but ICC, if you want the fastest, it is the fastest thing out there that you can use, especially when you use uh, a lot of the more advanced features and use them correctly. Um, also, uh, diversification is one of the byproducts of, of what we do. Um, we find bugs in kernel code. We find little things that, that just happen because we hit the code from a different direction than most people do. We take a different look at it because we're using a different compiler. We think that that makes the code better. Um, it also opens up a different dimension of freeness if you think about it. Um, Linux source code is free for everybody to use. Um, but most people just take that and, and use it in a very generic sense, like put throw Ubuntu on their laptop. But what we're doing with our project actually opens up a few more dimensions as to uh, freedom of what you can actually do when the source code is yours and you can custom tailor it. Um, like I was saying, there's freedom. 
we're at a choice where there is none right now. Um, as we all know from Microsoft, monopolies are not a good thing in the IT industry. Um, GCC needs competition to keep it good, to keep it lean, and we're trying to do that with ICC. So, uh, where it all started really was me tinkering with Jintu, you know, hanging out with different <laughs> Jintu guys in the Jintu forums, and Woo. yes, <laughs> just looking at different ICC, you know, we're, we're out there, you know, wow, compiling is great, you know, watching this stuff scroll by for hours is amazing. <laughs> What can we do to spice that up a little bit? <laughs> you know, that sounds like the Gen 2 form. <laughs> so we yeah, found this. Life past, we should say, How long is this thing going to compile? <laughs> I don't know, a day or two. That's <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long, a long time. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I stumbled across ICC and some threads in the Gen 2 forums, and I just started. You know, messing around with it, just for the heck of it, compiling different stuff, Python, Perl, and you know, I just thought, wow, uh, what if we could compile the kernel with this? Somebody out there has had to have tried this, you know, because ICC is out there. I ICC is out there for Linux, it's out there for OS X, it's out there for Windows. Um, the thing about that, though, is that it's only free for people to use on Linux. By the way, I don't think you can download the Mac OS one for free, or the Windows one for free. It's only for sale for those platforms. It is closed source, that is a problem with that. We're hoping that gets fixed. Yes. I follow up with one on this. <laughs> um, so I started Googling, and I actually found this guy, Ingo A. Kublin, who is in Germany. Uh, he is an amazing guy. He had some very mad scientist-like patches going on back in the later 2.4 kernels around 2004 to 2000, uh, probably 2006 he went, no, I don't think he kept going. He, he went to kernel 2.6.9, his, his, uh, his patches. Very in-depth patches, very complex and complicated patches to get working. Uh, but once you did, you had performance benefits up to 40% uh, for a lot of different stuff. So it, it was worth it. Um, he has this site here, Frillium.org, which is still up, still has his patches up there. It hasn't been updated since 2004. I can't get a hold of this guy. He's in Germany somewhere. <laughs> you know, I, I'd love to know, you know, if you guys bump into this guy, we can do this better. Um, is it huh? He has such sophisticated stuff, <laughs> and it's not updated for many years. Is he still alive? Gosh, I hope so. I don't know. You know, that, it, it is odd because his website hasn't been updated since 2004. So, but he does security work too, and a lot of complex stuff. So maybe he's off the grid somewhere. He went crazy. He um, might. He might have teamed up with. Uh, Hans Reiser. He never accomplished. The compliment. The compliment. Okay. Maybe we shouldn't have him as a team. We can explain why his patches are so crazy, but uh, anyway. Um, so, so going on, uh, we went to the Intel forums. I started. Um, I, I submitted a, a thread, and I met a guy, a Chinese uh, developer at Intel, named Fei Long Wang. Uh, who is a very nice person, a very good developer. Uh, he pointed me to a patch that was working, that he had working with Red Hat 2.6.18. Um, there was an intermediate script that was needed at the time, it's called the wrapper, which sits between ICC and the kernel source, and you invoke it, and it does a lot of different things. Mainly, it filters out incompatible things that ICC says, what is this GCC? Jump, I don't understand it, oh, it means this. That's what basically the wrapper was. Um, and uh, so that was 2.618. We, we started working with it, and uh, we couldn't get it to work. We were working on it for like four months. 
Um, meanwhile, the thread was just getting crazy. We're getting a whole bunch of views. We got over 160,000 views on this one thread in Intel. Probably got to be the biggest thread we've got. So it was getting a lot of attention. Um, and we found there's a guy um, who's their, our, main, our main developer right now, uh, Lui Ching, who is in China also. Um, he said, well, why don't you just try this? And we tried it and it worked. And I said, okay, <laughs> we got it working. We got it working with 2.622, which is our proof of concept, which, which became the proof of concept. Um, after 2.622, there were some things that were not working correctly. We had to do some tweaking, and um, we've got that going now. Right now, we're up to the latest, like I showed you guys, that, that latest patch we got working. So like I was saying, Lu Yi Ching is the head of development for, Lu, for uh, Linux DNA. Uh, he's in Shanghai. So is Fei Long. Um, they're great, great guys. Very interested in what they do, and yes, they are above my head when it comes to coding. I don't want to be. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to know as much because they just, they just amaze me with some of the stuff they do. So um, I, I let him go with it, and he loves to do it. Um, every day you find something new. I mean, you, you get something to compile that would not compile. We had a lot of people asking. Um, can we get open as a self compiled? Because that would be interesting. And a lot of people said, no, you can't because it's so deep rooted in GCC semantics that it won't compile. And he got it to compile finally uh, one of the latest uh, releases of ICC with the no ICC flag. And it works, it works great. Um, Xi Long is in Germany, another Chinese guy, but he is in Germany. He's been doing a lot of 32-bit patches. He's taken over basically. Uh, we've had requests, you know, of course, for 32-bit patches still. Um, and he's been keeping up and kind of backporting the, the work that we've done for the 64-bit patches back to the 32-bit. Um, Jerome Motel, Motwill, who is in Arizona, um, he's come to the, the project fairly recently, has been doing a lot of I guess you would say QA or additions to our patches. Um, Louis really is responsible for making it happen, but you got people who come in with uh, complex and exotic configurations and said, we ran into this bug with this, and we ran into this bug with that, and he just adds some lines to the code to our patch, and all of a sudden we've got a more, you know, a better quality patch that works with more Linux distributions. Um, like I was saying, Fei Long, he is with Intel, he's an Intel developer in China. We also, I think it's at the bottom of the page, you can't see it. Uh, there's Max, who is an Intel developer at, and I can't remember his last name, sorry Max, right now. <laughs> at, um, he is in uh, Portland, working uh, at Intel. And uh, he's been doing a lot of uh, work with us also. So yeah, I mentioned earlier that ICC is a closed source compiler, um, which probably makes a lot of people wonder, well, what about the code that it produces? Are there any you know, caveats with that? Um, no, not with us. There can be in certain situations, but the final end product is always GPL2 compliant. So you've got GPL2 code coming in, and you've got GPL2 code coming out. So. That um, is obviously a good benefit. Um, ICC compiler is free for your personal usage. Uh, it does cost for um, corporations, governments, education, etc. who want to use it. Um, Intel has graciously given us the pro version for free for our product, for our, our project. Um, we ask for that because um, ICC uses some libs that are more high performance, and you get more performance if you link to those, those lips. And uh, for instance, our Firefox will not work without those lips because we've compiled for them. So there's a redistributable, there's a small package that you can redistribute, redistribute with your Firefox to make it work. And um, we couldn't redistribute it like that otherwise. 
So that is a, a caveat. Obviously, we can do that with GCC compatibility. You don't need those clips. Um, but, you know, since we're performance based, we try to, you know, squeeze out as much performance as we possibly can. Uh, so right now we have three major projects. Obviously the first one is the kernel. Uh, to make the kernel fast and make it easier. Like I was saying earlier, the wrapper in the middle was, was very, um, it was just an extra step in a rather long and complex uh, step for the process to get the kernel compiled. So we kind of cut that out. We're also working with SGI to engineer an Altic supercomputer kernel for their legacy Itanium and possibly their future Itanium supercomputers. Uh, running into a few issues there because it is a different architecture. Uh, ICC will work with it, but um, we have run into a few bugs. SGI doesn't exist. They do. Well, they, they're with uh, Rockable Systems. But the SGI name, the brand is still alive. But they did file for bankruptcy. Um, also, uh, we're working with uh, Intel to provide uh, an ICC model of Linux repo uh, for packages like Firefox, the kernel, uh, other things that we can easily boost performance for. So uh, the Linux DNA vision or our philosophy is a little bit different. We take a different look at things than uh, a normal corporation would look at things where manageability really is the centerpiece of your code, being able to you know, make sure that all the pieces fit together nicely, uh, not necessarily fast code. Um, so that's a general purpose computing scenario where you're throwing on an I386 binary on your computer and it works, but it's not necessarily the best thing that you could have on your computer. It's not the fastest thing. Um, so we're talking more about specific purpose computing where your code is built for a specific processor for a specific purpose, really. Um, and we just call that SPC. Um, SPC is faster, greener, um, and really a lot of times what you were after Big companies like IBM are developing and um, looking into R&D for SPC in the future. So um, to break it down, SPC examples, um, for instance, uh, risk CPU for networking, uh, you have less instructions to execute uh, for networking, for network appliances, because uh, packages are transmitted in Big Indian. So that just makes more sense to use that kind of code, that kind of uh, chip for that kind of scenario. Um, software to two Linux, the ability to compile the system for a specific platform, uh, and streamline that hardware for a specific purpose. Um, you hear, you get the catchphrase, uh, juice a lot out there, just enough OS. Ubuntu and uh, SUSE and some others as some bare bone appliance type um, uh, Linux distributions that are basically just there to do one thing, you know, be a web server, be a database, and that's all they do. We like that. That's a great idea. It cuts down on unneeded bloat complexity, um, and it does help performance in a lot of aspects, um, improve security. Uh, so, uh, right, there's room for improvement, we think, um, and we're trying to evolve these things and bring them to the next level of our project. So earlier, I was saying that it's faster and greener. Uh, the reason that it's greener uh, is that optimized code is faster, it executes faster, it finishes faster, um, that means it takes less electricity, less time, and all that equals money, and um, that's always better also. Um, so in a lot of scenarios, you can forego investment on your hardware and speed up your existing infrastructure um, and, and get a noticeable boost just like you would just put in a new CPU.
So um, near the beginning, I think everybody remembers Windows. It's still out there, kind of. Um, it's a monolithic OS. It has to be ready for anything because everybody's running it. What your secretary is doing with it is completely different from your scientists. But you know, it's got to know how to work in both scenarios. So it is the general purpose blob of code. It's a lot of code. Uh, it's over 50 million lines of code, uh, according to stuff I've read on Google. Who knows how big it is, really, but it's a lot. Um, and that's not including uh, at your application basis, like Office, which is just going to make that even more ridiculous. Um, and it's also been estimated that it needs about 20 billion CPU operations just to get to the lock-in screen. <laughs> How many for clipping? <laughs> I don't know. How many to get the blue screen? <laughs> <laughs> One. <laughs> that one's optimized. <laughs> <laughs> you get to sort through 20 billion of those operations just to find that blue screen. It's quite nice. Um, so, a couple years ago, when this, you know, he kind of hints to the community that the kernel was getting a little bit big. It was getting bloated. Um, and that is because Linux is suffering from basically the same things that Windows does, because it is a general purpose operating system. It has to be ready for anything and everything. So um, because of that, you kind of, it kind of gets dull teeth. Um, and it gets fork like it's a generic picture, if you will. Um, in a perfect world, you would have an amazingly fast CPU with a whole lot of cache memory, even more regular memory, and all of that kernel and all that kind of stuff would work perfectly with that cache. Um, and it does not, it does not get spit out of the memory. This is just gigantic. Um, it's hardware abstracted, abstracted. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but that is something that cuts down on performance. Um, but it does help the portability and make Linux what it is today, obviously. And there is mixed code in there. Uh, C is very fast. You know, it's a very fast language. It's probably the best language out there. But uh, there are scenarios where it is just it's just too slow. You know, um, and in that scenario, they have to resort to assembly. Um, so then you've got mixed code, and then you get a little bit of spaghetti code in there because of that. That's a problem that we run into with our project. That it makes things a little bit more complex, but um, so like I was saying, um, they get bloated. You know, it just happens. Nobody's fault. Everybody wants it to do something, so you know, it's out there. Um, it has to be able to work with anything. They have hardly any idea what CPU they're working on, um, and of course, there's backwards compatibility, which is everybody's favorite. That work with their old VHS tape deck. So, <laughs> so a lot of people are probably thinking, well, gosh, you know, kernel compiling sounds kind of complex, and uh, I'm not sure it's going to be worth my time. Um, in some scenarios, it might not be, but in a lot of different scenarios, it is. Um, so, uh, for instance, if you have a server that uses a, a TCP offloading engine or a tow NIC card, you've got a lot of different things, um, depending on the NIC card, that can be actually offloaded to that NIC card. Um, and that software that works with that turns out to be redundant for a lot of things that are happening in the kernel. So what happens is that was the kernel and reduces the performance. Um, so if you were to recompile your kernel, you could take a lot of that out and make things a lot more streamlined. Um, let's see what else I want to say. Yeah. Basically, basically sounds like that. Another problem is, um, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, why is this still, why are kernels still out there on, you know, I386, I686? And the reason is, 
once again, it's really hard to keep up with the hardware changes out there because um, one P4 from one iteration is not the same thing that it was from the next iteration. For instance, uh, the first P4 core had no HT, it was a different socket, and it had uh, the SSC vector instruction set. Uh, the next core, the Northwood, had HT. It still had the same uh, instruction set, but things get kind of interesting when Prescott comes out because it has SSA3 and a lot of things out there. If you compile it directly for the Prescott, and all of a sudden your Prescott CPU goes bad, oh, well, I'll just pop in my old CPU and put it back in there. No, it's not going to work. There's no backwards compatible. So all of that great SSE goodness that you could get from advanced features in SSC3, really nobody can program for. Nobody can, you know, they say, well, wow, that's great, but um, my code base is still back here on the original P4. You know, so we can't take care of that. We can't work with that. So, you know, eventually that, that kind of goes away over time. But as you can see, we're still on I-386 on a lot of things. So, you know, that's, that's still out there. Slowly but surely it'll go away, but um, that's the problem. Um, later, Prescott models get even more complex. They've got 64-bit extensions. Obviously, that's not that compatible. Um, uh, and uh, they execute disabled technology. They go dual core. Some of them have HT. Some of them are just dual core, et cetera, et cetera. What is HT? Hyperthread. So we've come to the problem. <laughs> That was the problem with my monolithic giant OSs. You know, they are, they can't be SPC. Windows cannot do that. It would take them ridiculous amounts of money, which they have. But you know, we'll get into that later. Um, but you know, it's just a lot of work to reduce to release something for every single architecture and then the CPUs, sub architectures. So um, if you can't optimize for a P4. There's ways that you can kind of cut a square peg, round it off, and hammer it into a, a, a circular uh, piece. Um, so how we do that is with ICC. We employ two different flags that make this possible, the IPO and the PGO. Um, and we'll get into what all that is in just a little bit. But um, these help step around some of the problems that you can't just directly head on tap. Um, and because of what I said before, it just won't be backwards compatible, it won't work with everything. So the great thing about Linux is that it's open source. So we can take that code and we can do what we want to with it. We can customize it on a personal level a level that is not possible with a closed source operating systems. And uh, we use ICC to do that because it's the fastest thing out there. So I, ICC, as I was saying before, has some flags that are of interest. GCC, I should mention, does have these flags. Uh, they're not as fast, but they do work. They are just you know, we're not going to say don't use GCC's flags because they are great. They are they do a good thing. Like I was saying, these are flags that ICC um, has a little bit of an advantage at. Uh, Interprocedural optimization is what IPO stands for. There are three flags right now with IPO. There's IP, IPO, and IPO1. IPO1 is what we pioneered with the Firefox to get that working. Uh, PGO, Profile Guided Optimization, very interesting. It's kind of complex, but you get some really spectacular results, especially with open source code when you use the PGO. Uh, vectorization, um, like I was saying, the SSC3 extensions that you're worth, but you might be familiar with uh, single instruction, multiple data. Um, that's what vectorization is about. Vectorization started way back in the 60s. And it's really the platform for a lot of modern day code. It makes a lot of things that were not possible um, because everybody had to write an assembly in lower languages like that. It's now possible with uh, higher end languages like C and Fortran. 
etc. Uh, high end math algorithms, uh, a lot of that has to do with the libraries that ICC employs. Um, ICC is also very good when it comes to hyper threading, uh, multiple cores, SMP, etc. So, um, IPO, Internet Procedural Optimization, is a heuristically based optimization scheme. Um, like I was saying, uh, there are three different flags. The latest to IPO and IPO1 basically do the same. IP uh, does what it does on a single file. Um, it's easier to use, it works with a lot of different programs, and um, that, that, that usually works a lot better. IPO and IPO1 are a little more finicky, but you get better results out of them. Um, IPO takes an entire op uh, application and, and does what it does uh, and weeds out an efficient code and uh, basically frees up uh, registers, SMP units, SIMP units, et cetera. Profile guided optimization um, is a lot like, it's the difference between buying a suit at Belts and then going to a tailor and having yourself custom built a suit. Um, and, and how PGO does this is uh, it creates multiple stages. Um, the first stage, you make the code with the prop use, but I'll get into that. Um, and then you start up the program. Like for instance, you make Firefox, you start it up, and then you start using it like you normally would. And in the background, what happens is there's a whole bunch of different different files being uh, made. And PGO is, is profiling what you're doing with Firefox. Uh, it's creating some what are called dying files in the background. Um, once you're finished using Firefox, you recode, you re, excuse me, you recreate Firefox, you make it again, and PGO takes that information that it found out about what you use Firefox for, uses it and creates a final binary. And that final binary is faster for the specific purposes that you're using Firefox for. So if you do nothing but open blank tabs all day long with Firefox, <laughs> and then you recompile it and have the flag faster with blank tab, Opening Firefox out there. Yeah. So to break it down, I just have this out here uh, real quick. Um, the first um, house a source with a prop gen option. That's a flag that you have to add in there. I'll show that in a little bit. Um, takes that information uh, and creates a binary. It runs the, the, the uh, executable one more time. So it doesn't matter how many times. I should also mention that if you run Firefox, you run Firefox, you run Firefox, you can take all of those dying files, combine them, and, and make a Firefox that works uh, with everybody's dying files, yes. So basically it takes code and puts it in line, so it, those binaries are tend to be a bigger that the PGO binaries tend to be bigger than the IP binaries? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, you can use PGO and IPO together, actually. In fact, that's the best way to do it because then you can really thin things out. Um, but it takes the information on how you're, you're, you're making it and it basically, it, it optimizes it for that specific purpose. Um, what it does is it takes all those dying files and it puts it into a DPI file. Um, and this, this can be downloaded if you guys want to take a little bit of time and, and just and it explains it a little bit better than I can, I can say it here, I suppose. Um, and it's at linuxdna.com slash presentation dot ODP. Um, but when, anyway, when, once you're through with it, it spits out a custom built Firefox or anything else that you want to plot. So here's the benchmark that we have for Firefox 3.5 when we first got PGO working. Uh, so we use the Google P8 benchmark. 
But please don't compare this to Chrome. I know Chrome is amazing with this benchmark. It also happens to be Google's benchmark, so. Anyway, we can use different ones for that. But uh, as you can see, there is a noticeable jump in, in performance. Um, one thing to remember, though, about PGO, though, is it can produce fake results in your benchmarks. So, for instance, if you want, I don't know, your V8 benchmark to look better, then all you have to do is run that V8 benchmark in Firefox and then recompile it, and then, wow, you've got that. I don't know how much real-world goodness that is, but, you know, it does show up great in benchmarks. Uh, like I was saying, vectorization, um, most of you guys know what vectorization is, right? You guys are pretty much familiar with it. You know, it gets big press in, in programs like Photoshop when you're applying to Blur, it uses those SSD extensions. No? No. What if we happen to not be familiar with <laughs> your term? Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, Could you give a brief explanation, please? <laughs> Um, so vectorization, uh, when we're talking about codes, um, you got a lot of loops in code. When code gets bulky, when higher generation uh, languages like Fortran and, and C, it's just not as compact as if you had written it with assembly. Vectorization units are there originally to break that down to make it much easier for the processor to handle. Those co those coprocessor units, um, starting with M M M X, were employed in the Intel CPU chipsets. Um, today, an easy example of how SSC works would be with Photoshop, and you want to blur something, and you just blur out the entire picture. That's one single instruction. It blurs that on all the data that's revolved that that particular photo all the data that you give it in that particular photo. And it uses SSC to do that. Um, when you're using ICC and you're compiling up and you, you start to see stuff like loop was vectorized, that's when you know that vectorization, those SSC units, are actually being used. I should mention that GCC, um, if you use the O3 flag, I don't know if you guys are big into that, but right now that actually adds in vectorization. You used to have to actually um, uh, specify that with GCC, but not any longer in use O3. So um, some of the other stuff that ICC has is the debugger, the credibility blocks, integrated performance primitives, and that kernel library. We don't really get into a whole lot of that. We just kind of let those things do what they do. So ICC is pretty easy to use. Um, a lot of people make fun of Jitsu because people get pretty crazy with their flags. Fun roll just, loops. Exactly, fun roll loops for instance. You know, they just have these gigantic flags that sometimes spit out good binary, sometimes it's just a waste of time to compile it. Um, ICC, you don't have to do all that. You, Basically, it, 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 it takes it and knows what to do with it a lot easier with a lot less flags. Um, here's a couple of examples. This is for SSC2, I believe. If I'm not mistaken, I don't use that one much anymore. But um, it's got O3 just like GCC does. Um, for this particular instance, we're using IPO um, and we're using GCC. So GCC. Yes. So ICC has as a C flag, GCC. So GCC is an ICC C flag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it adds compatibility, if you will. Um, yeah, if you don't want to use a lot of loops and stuff like that, that's a good flag to have. Sometimes it's a great flag. Sometimes it actually screws things up. But most of the time, it's a good thing to use when you're doing fibers. Let's see. The two here. This is the PropGen uh, examples. So with the first one, you're using PropGen, uh, which is your PGO, and that's when it creates a, a binary that 
can actually figure out what's going on. Um, after you executed that app, you recompile it with prop use, then it knows to take those dime files, merge them into the DPI file, spit out, and use that information to spit out a binary that has that, uh, that optimization that you want. And like I was saying, you can use IPO along with PGO. That's a dream team that you want to use together to get good performance. So originally, like I was saying, we had the rapper. Um, he was extremely gangster to work with. A lot of people thought he was a thug, so we got rid of him. Um, he is still out there. Um, he just kind of hangs out in the background of development. Um, because he is useful, he is a useful guy. Um, but basically what he did, and what he does, uh, translates GCC semantics to ICC. Uh, that, that's the big thing right there. Um, you can also give him certain optimizations and he will um, pass those along to ICC. Um, right now, what we use him for mainly uh, is working with SGI to get their Itanium systems working correctly. Itanium's uh, ICC uh, compiler is different than uh, the regular x86 and x86-64 compiler. It doesn't like assembly at all. That's one of the big things right there. It does not want to work with uh, anything that was written for GCC. It just wants to spit out C code. That's all it does on this is hey, just C, please. So that's a problem. So what we do is we filter out Anything that does not work with uh, ICC, we put it into the wrapper so that when we pass that uh, to ICC, it says, oh, okay, don't compile that with ICC. Give that to GCC, or just leave it alone. It's already compiled, and, and just go from there. So the old way, as you can see, was a little bit complex. Once you had everything just like you wanted it, you had this uh, very long thing that you, you put in here. Um, you had to have your Intel wrapper in there. It had to be the right wrapper. Um, don't use JC words or anything it used to be, and things will work out. So we got rid of that because it was just an extra step that did not need to be uh, in there. We've added that to our patches. Um, so now, uh, the new way, just make, just run make. That's all you have to do. Um, of course, you can pass on any other things that you want to pass in there, like make modules, install, all that kind of good stuff. Um, yeah, ICC is pedantic. <laughs> when you use it, you might think that things are going crazy. But you know, I did, but I just RMRF my hard drive. What is all this stuff going on here? Um, it just gives a lot of different output, especially when you hand it something that's like, hey, I'm GCC code specifically. It just starts telling you every little thing, like this is weird, but I just compiled the kind of information that, that pops out there. Um, like I said, it's different looking uh, output than GCC. Um, and we do have uh, a good uh, instruction uh, PDF uh, it's linuxdna.com slash install.pdf that should step you through the basics of getting a system compiled. I would recommend using uh, Gentoo to work with this. That's just my two cents on that. You want to that. Anyway, that's the, that's the best way to do it. Yeah. That's your Gentoo plug for the people. That is it. It's, well, it's <laughs> one of them. I would say it's a plug for your sanity if you're going for an entire operating system from scratch on a different compiler. So, um, I like it Is that why you made it chatty? So people who are doing entire Gen 2 stalls have a little more to look at, a little more to digest for the day or two? Uh, actually, that was just built in goodness. It's like, ooh, something new to look at. I've never seen that. <laughs> awesome. Um, so here's a Debian compile example. Um, I, I don't want to get into too much of this. I've got a couple of good uh, examples. If 
you guys want to look at it, just look at presentation.wp on, on the Linux DNA mirror. But one thing that you should know um, is that in most cases, if you're not using Jitsu, you will have to use, you will have to source ICC correctly uh, in order to uh, use it once you've installed it. It doesn't just work out of the box. This string right here is what you want. Source, it lives in opt because it's old school when it just wakes up. Um, Intel compiler uh, and the version number. And at the end, after this guy here, you actually specify what architecture that you want uh, it to compile for. In this case, I832, I don't know why they didn't put Intel 32, but it's just I832 means 32-bit binaries. Um, in this case, Intel 64 at the end, 64-bit binaries. Uh, the Itanium one is IA64. You won't ever use it, so I know. If you were using Gen 2, would you be able to use GCC config just like you switch between versions of GCC and Gen 2 normally? Or is um, a little more involved than that? I guess you could. I mean, it, it shouldn't matter, I don't think. Um, so, one thing to make sure that this is in the background, if you just want to use this or you just want to use that, you can put it in your bash RC file, this line, and then you don't have to source it. One thing to remember, though, is if you do update your compiler, not only do you want to make sure that you change that, but every now and then, on a blue moon, Intel changes its directory structure here. So it changes it from, like this is compiler, but it's actually supposed to be a capital C compiler. And then sometimes it was changed to something else. I can't remember what the original one was back in 10, but it's different than that. So just, you want to make sure that you've got that. So this just goes into how to use, uh, how to basically inject ICCO, this is one of the old wrapper stuff in here. I should have updated this channel. Uh, anyway, I don't want to get into that too much because, I don't know. Uh, once again, this is just using the RPM method, if you will, uh, with ICC. Jitsu is pretty easy. These are the things that you want to add at the bottom. Here's your basic flags. With Jitsu, you can also specify on a per package basis how you want things compiled. It works the same way with GCC as it does with ICC. Um, you just have a subdirectory, which I can't remember, ICC flags, I think. I can't remember what it is right now on the top of my head. Uh, anyway, uh, that works with ICC as, uh, just the same as it would with GCC. Right, so we do have problems uh, with GCC. Uh, the majority of the problems are when we get into spaghetti code with C and ASM blocks inside of it. And the reason is, is usually when they write the ASM, it has to be a little bit more specific for the compiler, and they write that for GCC. And ICC takes a look at it and says, what the heck is this? And I don't know what it is. Guess what? Fail. So, that causes a lot of problems. Um, sometimes with ICC, it'll compile something and say, hey, look, your new Firefox is ready. Oh, okay, let me execute it. Hey, I'm working, I'm working, blink. There's something weird going on here. It's gone. So it compiles it, it creates it, but it's not really working. So that's one of the things we have to do. We have to be careful and debug things to make sure that they're working correctly. Uh, that's one of the main reasons that IPO went to IPO1. Um, like I said, we're working with the Itanium kernel, but it has become an epic fail. And if you get that, anybody got that joke? Nobody. You know why? Because nobody understands that the Itanium processor is the explicitly parallel instruction set computing CPU. <laughs> so it literally is an epic fail. So we're still working on that. Could be an epic win. 
So um, basically, you know, we want to take the world and maybe run Linux. This is how we're going to do it. Um, the latest vanilla kernel ICC compatible with IP on PGO. We have uh, this right now. We're working on IPO and PGO. Right now we're tackling IPO. Things have gotten a lot better with IPO1, that flag. We get very close to it to compile, um, but at, at the end it said, you know what, here's a party gift. No thanks. <laughs> um, so we're still working on that. Um, PGO would be amazing because that means that you have a custom kernel for whatever you're using it for. So if you've got a, want a kernel that does web serving a whole lot better, PGO will help that happen. And I should mention that this is something that Ingo actually did with his patches. This is why he had amazing mad scientist level patches because he had IPO and PGO working with his patches way back on 2.64. Um, the problem is we've run into some architecture hardware problems with uh, the latest CPUs. Um, PGO, uh, the PGO daemon, PGD, PGO guy, it just turns out to be, um, it does not like multiple cores. It does not like SMP. And it may or may not corrupt your data when you use it to create your kernel when it profiles. And I don't know. Last time we got into that, we started getting into the Heisenberg uncertainty principle <laughs> at Red Hat. And I don't really know quantum mechanics well enough to really comment on that, so I'm going to steer clear of that. Um, but we want to get that working. That would be amazing. Uh, it would be making make things a lot faster. Um, fully ICC optimized system. Uh, we've got a lot of things compiled that we didn't think would compile, like export, for instance, uh, and OpenSSL. But there are those specific problems, you know, those problem, problem binaries out there, problem source codes out there, like GCC, for instance, won't compile with ICC. Go figure, right? <laughs> won't work. And utils will not work. There, there's a few of them out there, but most everything will pretty much, you know, let us do it uh, eventually if we nag it enough. Um, one of the things that we thought was an interesting idea um, that we don't have the resources really to pursue at this point, we would love to, to get this going and get it out the door. But basically, an entire system, a live CD system that you would pop into your system, you would use it for a week, week and a half. And it would optimize in the background how you use that live CD. So it takes those dime files that you made and it uses that as your DNA and creates a system, recompiles a system that's specifically for you on your on your system. And um, it would be nice. It'd be nice, but you know we've got some hurdles to get all that all that work. And that's a lot of a lot of development and all that stuff. Uh, like I said, um, we're working with Intel to get a Amigo ICC repo out there, slowly but surely. That's why they gave us these two netbooks here to make sure that we can get some very nice ICC optimized Linux kernels and, and different uh, binaries out there for that. Um, distro repos for RPM and dev based systems, relatively easy. Once we do this, we pretty much got this RPM side tackled. So a lot of the things that we do for Migo, since it is RPM based, uh, will work uh, with uh, Red Hat and other RPM based systems. Um, and another thing that we've kind of messed around with is uh, diversifying with different compilers out there. Uh, we've tried to get a hold of Sun, and we still have not got a hold of them because they're Oracle now and we're not sure what's going on. They hate Java or something and they want to prove it wants to prove that open source code is in fact profitable. And if you don't believe that now, I don't know when you'll ever believe it, but you know, that's one of the things that's out there. But we would love to be able to take the kernel and say, hey, look, this is a new compiler, compile with this one. Oh, look, we found some bugs, we fixed them. Here's another one, hey, we found some more bugs, we fixed it. Hey, we found another compiler, compiler with, we fixed it. 
at the end, we think that that's going to really increase the quality of the code that you've got. It's going to diversify things. That's the theory behind that. So the rest of this, uh, I'll touch on briefly. This is just an idea that we have working in the background. Right now, we do not have the development resources to get any of this kind of thing going. But this gets into basically the customization of uh, what we can do with uh, operating system like Linux, that everything is free for you to take and, and work with and custom tailor uh, using ICC, using the advanced stuff like PGO to get it work. A self-evolving Linux would be able to work somewhat like the live CD scenario that I was explaining before. <coughs> um, of course, it could work on a regular system also. It could be, while you're working on it, it could be creating things in the background. You kick off a job on the weekend, it optimizes your system, rebuilds it, you come into work on Monday, and all of a sudden your system's a lot faster. All of a sudden, it has adapted to how you use it. And you know, that would be a very big plus. For you. You know, that would be something that I think a lot of people would be interested in instead of having the same cookie cutter. Oh, hey, here it is, window. Yes. So when you build, you'd give them flags for a PGO. Um, a, a PGO enabled um, binary. And then you, the next line you gave was to use the dyn files at the PGO. Can you? Uh, build something that both reads dying files and makes PGO oh, at the same time? Yeah. No, no. Because it needs that executable to say, what is it that I need to manage? Oh, I see this is the code that you're executing, but how are you, what, do you, what parts of it are you using? What, need, what needs to be optimized? And then it takes out those the hex, hex data and puts it in those dying files, combines it in the DPI for the next time you recompile it and spits out a faster um, system. So if, when you recompile it though, can we recompile it with the same flags that it's used? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is there a performance hit for doing that though? The better flags, you know, obviously the, the flags that suit the processor best are the ones that you want to use. You know, the latest flags for, for that processor. Yeah, you, you, you have to be really specific. For example, the classic gotcha for people using Gen 2 is they're using some old hardware like a Pentium 3 or an early Pentium 4 or Celeron and it's only got 256k of cache on the chip. So if you go and compile that 03, it's going to start unrolling loops and other things that makes the code bigger and you're going to exhaust your cache more so you're actually going to make the system slower when you optimize it. You, for like a, a chip like a Celeron, you want optimized for size and not the same, give me all the optimization 099 flag. Uh, it, you actually have to be very specific and picky per processor. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is, that is very true. You don't need to optimize everything with 03. I mean, that's the problem that classic chips do fit all. Like, oh, these are cool flags. This must make my code amazing. Yeah. Well, does the wrapper program, does it set those flags for you based on the processor you got? No. No. You mean like GCC would use GCC? I mean, why, why is it not intelligent enough to <laughs> it, not, not look at your current processor and not do? Right, right. Well, look, one of the reasons may be is that you're cross-compiling for a different processor, so you want to set that manually. However, at GCC right now, there's GCC March equals native, which says, hey, what the heck am I compiling for? What is the CPU that you got me on? Oh, it's a Pentium 4. March equals Pentium 4 is what we're going to compile everything for. Oh, okay. Or it's a Prescott 4, et cetera, like that. That's a feature that should be put into ICC, but I don't. I agree. <laughs> it, yeah, it might be out there. I might, I might have to talk to Long about that, but I haven't run across that. I don't think it's out there yet. It's probably something in the pipeline that will eventually. But yeah, um, when you're compiling for a, you know, a system, not everything needs to be 03, have fancy flags on. Some things you just don't use. You know, specifically, if you're making a processor, that, uh, a system that's built for you, there's certain things that you just don't use, that you just don't care about. So you can use optimize for size for those particular parts. And um, then, you know, 
you've actually got something that's giving more attention to the things that need to have attention in your code. Um, you know, if you were really crazy, you could go to the kernel and go to each individual make file and say, oh, okay, I don't use this part of the kernel of OS. I use this sometimes O2. I use this a lot, O3. We should try that, you know, and then you know, keep going like that. But um, that insanity right there is why you see in the Jitsu handbook, just use March equals Pentium 4 pipe O2, and everything will be perfect. Because they see that gigantic iceberg underneath the water, and they say, you know what, I really don't want to get into this with you right now. Just use March equals Pentium 4, and you'll be okay. And, and, and for enterprise especially, weird things happen when you start cutting flags on. And I thought it was just a big joke, but I, I had a server where I, I went with the very conservative for Gen 2, uh, the specific architecture for the processor, Pipe and O2. And Qmail got a bug when you introduced dash O2 where Qmail would run, it would act normally, but it would not deliver any mail. And it was not a configuration problem. It's a problem introduced into the into QMail when you compile it under dash O2. And it's infuriating to find out after you burn how many hours looking to say, it's got to be a config problem. It's got to be a config problem. It's got to be a config problem. And you finally go and file the super long bug report, and they go, oh, you're on Gen 2. What were your C flags? And they go, dash O2. And they laugh and say, cut that off and come back. And, and you, you cut it off and compile QMail, and all of a sudden everything works. And it only it only does that for two versions of Qmail. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was it's like a black hole. It, it didn't it didn't show up in a log file as an error. It didn't say it didn't return to sender undeliverable. It just went into the void, never to return. And it didn't say anything about it. Fun bugs. Uh, after it hit a certain limit, things just didn't work anymore. 